But we are continuing a series called Paranormal, where we're looking at the, the, uh, the spiritual realm. Things, uh, as we talked about when we started this series, uh, we might call it paranormal, we may call it the occult, kind of using those words uh, synonymously. But why is it important to talk about this? Partly it's because it has exploded in our culture. More and more people believe in the paranormal, the supernatural realm. But more than that, more and more people are interacting with the paranormal and supernatural realm, whether they realize it or not. Just because you may not know you're doing something doesn't mean you're, you're innocent, right? If you've done it, it can open yourself up to things. So let me give you an example. You may not be aware of this, but uh, TV and movie producers have begun this practice of hiring what they call occult consultants. When they are making a movie that has any kind of magic, witchcraft, spells, incantations, they bring them in because those that practice such things say you have to be really careful with magic. Because a spell cast, whether it's in front of a camera or whether it's in a, uh, a circle, can have power. We want what is being represented out there to be as real and authentic as possible so people can come into contact with the supernatural realm. That is their, that's the whole point of a, 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 a cult consultant. So Dylan Bauer said this, he is a consultant on, you may have heard uh, the AMC show, uh, the Mayfair Witches. That's a show, and, and many of them, I could give you a whole list of, of shows that hire occult consultants. And here's what he, Dylan said. He said, they let me know what they wanted to achieve magically, and I filled in the blanks. If there were herbs or spells that they chanted, I provided it so that it would be real, so that people would be exposed to something. It's not just innocent. It's not just uh, harmless. We are opening ourselves up, whether we know it or not, to the spiritual realm. And as a result of that, things can come into your heart, into your life, into your spirit that will torment you and cause problems and issues, not necessarily straight away, but over days, weeks, months, years, and decades. So let me just start by saying um, that there is a difference between the occult, between um, real world magic and make-believe, fairy tales, fantasy books. Right in a lot of uh, fantasy novels, uh, the magic that's represented there is, is fantasy. It's make-believe. It's, it's similar to the superpowers that, that, they, that Superman has right? in, in a comic book. It's, it's kind of mechanical in nature. The point of it is not to get us in touch with the paranormal or supernatural realm. Really, in most fantasy books, the point is it's the age-old tale of good versus evil that evil must be resisted and evil must be overcome. And magic is simply a weapon that is used mo oftentimes on both sides, on, for the side of good and for the side of evil, and they're battling. And it is frequently used metaphorically as the idea that even the weakest among us can find the power to overcome evil. So there's a difference between that and the occult, the paranormal, when, when chance and real world incantations are being pushed into our face, and opening our spirits to something. Now, what does that mean, parents? Does that mean you should let your kids read fantasy novels uh, from the best-selling uh, series out there to unknown ones? I'm not going to tell you what to do. I know a lot of people would like me to tell you what to do because it's a lot easier to just to say, give me the rules and I'll follow the rules. But I'm not going to give you the rules and make you follow the rules. You are the parents. You have to discern uh, what's best and right for your children. You have to seek the heart of God. But what I'll tell you is this, what you need to do is to make sure your children understand the difference between fairy tale ma magic, between make-believe magic, between fantasy magic and real world witchcraft and the occult. Because one is innocent and the other is not. One opens our hearts and our spirits to something that's dark and that the Bible says to stay away from. So how do we distinguish? How do we know? How do we identify what is uh, harmless, what is even good, and what is counterfeit, what is evil? How do we begin to do that? Because not everything that glitters is gold. Not everything is innocent. At the same time, we don't want to trivialize that which is important. Because if we do, we end up looking silly. We run around like chicken little. There's a demon here, there's a demon here, there's a demon here. 
And then when it really matters and we bring a warning, it falls on deaf ears. So let me just, I'm old, okay? My kids will tell you, dad's old. Uh, so I, I, I grew up in the church in the 80s and the 90s, and there was this thing, you might not have even heard of it, some of you may have, but it was, they were, we were being warned against in the Christian circles, warned against this great evil that the devil and the demons were gonna get us through this thing called backward masking. Some of you are like, a backward mask? What is he talking about? So here was the deal, a record. Now vinyl is making a comeback, so maybe the devil's making a comeback in backward masking, but I don't think so. But here, here was the deal. If you found a certain album and you played it backwards at a certain speed, at just the right place in a song, demons had a secret message. And it would sound something like this. If you played it backwards, the right song, the right place, the right speed. <laughs> and they said, see, that just said you should worship the devil. Now, if that is the devil's ploy to get people to listen to an album backwards at the right speed, at the right song, at the right lyrics, I'm, I grew up then. I didn't have any friends that ever listened to an album backwards. I don't know anybody who did it, but a guy on the radio said, this is a... Now listen, the argument can be made. Some of those albums, the lyrics that they had played the right way aren't good, right, and wholesome, and why would you even listen to that? that that's a different argument. But the devil's not coming at you by a song being played backwards. But we trivialize those things. We end up looking goofy and silly. And then all of a sudden, when there's truly things that we need to be on guard against, people just dismiss us. So we don't want to trivialize what's important. At the same time, we don't want to look past those things that God warns us against. So what I want to do this morning is I want to give you three uh, characteristics, three distinguishing marks of things that are occult, paranormal in nature. So here's the first one. Trying to gain insight through spiritual means separate from God. The key there is, is Spiritual means. We're not talking about trying to learn um, you know, calculus. You don't have to learn calculus from the Bible. Indeed, you won't. But if you're trying to understand spiritual things, if you're trying to gain spiritual insight, spiritual wisdom, spiritual knowledge, some secret hidden truth that's out there, outside of God, you are dabbling in the occult. So things like... Um, psychic readings and tarot cards and tea leaves and astrology and um, oral readings, uh, numerology, you, on and on the list goes. Those things are attempts to gain insight, wisdom, knowledge outside of God. Now, you may say it's innocent. It's not a big deal. Listen to me. It's not innocent. and It is a big deal because that knowledge comes from somewhere. That insight you're attempting to glean is coming from somewhere. And as we learned when we started this series, right, the, the, the reality that we know is created from two realms, the physical realm and the spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm, there's God and the angels, but some of the angels rebelled, and now uh, there's a, a battle happening there. So in the spiritual realm, you have God and the angels and the devil and the demons. And so there is no innocent power out there just floating around. People say, oh, the universe doesn't work that way. There is no universal power out there. If you are seeking wisdom, knowledge, there's a voice, there's a consciousness, there's something that is giving you that knowledge. And if there's a voice, if there's a consciousness, then there's a mind behind that voice. There's a spirit behind those thoughts. And it's either God's Holy Spirit or it is of the devil and the demons. There is no other place it comes from. So if you're attempting to gain knowledge and wisdom and insight from some spirit other than God's spirit, then it is an evil spirit. It's demonic in nature. So it's not innocent. It's not fun. We have to be very, very careful about these things. Next week, you're going to hear from two people in this church who uh, walked down a path into the occult to the point where their lives were almost in shambles. They, they, they were doing things they never thought, they thought it was innocent. 
until they, they're terrified of them, of them very selves, of the things that they're seeing, of what's happening through them. So it doesn't lead you to a path of goodness. It leads you to a path of darkness. When you attempt to access spiritual insight and wisdom and knowledge outside of God. So things like, uh, let me talk for a moment about like uh, astrology and, and horoscopes, right? It, oh, they're no big deal. It's, listen, they are a big deal. So the, the moon, the stars, the sky, right? God created all. The Bible makes it really clear. God created the heavens and the earth, the cosmos, everything that we see. And it tells us in the book of Genesis that he created them for signs and seasons, so what that tells us is using the, uh, the things in the heavens, what we call the heavens, I don't mean the heavenly realm, but in the heavens, in the sky, the sun, the moon, the stars, the, the cycles of the, of the, of the moon and, and the, the rotation of things to understand, like uh, explorers, uncharted waters and using them for navigation. There's nothing wrong with that. Using them to understand times and seasons and the rotation and the movement of planets and, 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 and how the universe is moving. There's nothing wrong with that. To gain insight into things that are, that are happening in the physical realm, there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is when we begin to uh, assign to it some type of uh, mysticism or divination that somehow by... Um, deifying, by, by worshiping, by looking to the stars, we can understand what's going to happen. That's a dangerous thing. This is what it says in the book of Deuteronomy. It says, when you look up into the sky and see the sun, the moon, the stars, don't be seduced into worshiping them. There's nothing mystical about them. So you say, it's just a horoscope. It's not a big deal. I'm telling you, stop. It may start innocent, but it never ends there. Don't look to those things for spiritual insight. It also includes things like psychics and, and fortune telling and mystics and, and, and palm readings and tarot cards, things like that where we're trying to gain insight into the future. Right? We want to know what's going to happen. Let me just say two things. First of all, there's no one who understands what the future holds except the living God. That is a power reserved only for God. Read it throughout the Bible. Not even Satan knows the future. When someone speaks future prophecy, it's because the Spirit of God is giving them insight into what's going to happen. They're not, they don't know that on their own. So th there is nobody that knows the future. The second part is most of the time, it's a scam. It's a con. Mark Edwards, in his book, Psychic Blues, The Confession of a, of a False Psychic, says, I... I was a practicing psychic for decades. I never had any power. I never had any uh, spiritual insight. I conned people for years. How did I do it? He says, empathy, common sense, uh, my ability to, to say and, uh, things that were open-ended and watch and read people's responses to what I said to clobber together something that they would believe was accurate. So it's a con, it's a scam, or it's an attempt to access insight outside of God. It's an attempt to say, I want to know the future in God. If I can't trust you with my future, I'm going to go somewhere else to find out what the future holds. But here's what it says in the book of Zechariah. It says, people consult idols and fortune tellers, but the answers they get are lies and nonsense. Some interpret dreams, but they only mislead you. They comfort, the comfort that they give you is useless. It's an attempt to deceive because whether it's a con and you're being deceived or it's an evil spirit, here's the point. It is an attempt to move you to a point and a place where you're looking to someone other than God for insight and wisdom and knowledge. Now, for some of you, maybe you have um, gone to aura readings. Maybe you've gone to spiritualists. Maybe you've gone and, and, and to fortune tellers. Or maybe you know someone who has. Maybe you know someone who, who's gone and, and had those things, and they'll tell you something along the lines of, it's real. I'm telling you it's real. They told me things. They told me things that there's no way anybody could know. 
They told me things I never told anyone else. Here's what you need to understand. Just because the devil and his demons don't know the future doesn't mean they don't understand the present. And it doesn't mean they weren't there in the past. So you may have had a conversation. You may have said some things. You may have been involved in some things. And there's a spiritual world that our eyes, our natural eyes don't see. So you have no idea what demonic presence was there at that moment, hearing what you said, seeing what you did. And then they give that, whisper that into some psychic's ear and you say it's real. But just because something is accurate doesn't make it holy. Just because information is right doesn't mean it's righteous. And so, so often we get confused and say, well, it's, it's, yes, it is coming from somewhere, but it's not from God. That's why in 2 Corinthians 11, uh, Paul warns us, he says, Satan himself will come disguised as an angel of light. Is it any wonder that his servants appear as servants of righteousness? They, their attempt is always, always, always to deceive. They don't know the future. What they want to do is destroy your future. They want to lead you down a path from which you feel there is no coming back. The second sign of the occult of the paranormal is this. Attempting to connect with a spirit or supernatural power outside of the Holy Spirit. So this is things like um, seances, uh, channeling a spirit, summoning the spirit of a loved one. Now, it may seem that those things are somehow good. Somehow they may be helpful. They may be beneficial. I mean, listen, you got this couple, they've been married for 60 years and the spouse dies. And just to hear that word from that spouse that they miss after all these years, it brings comfort and peace. I mean, that, those parents that lost a child and they never got to say goodbye and they died in some horrific accident. They died as just a, as a small child, an infant even. And to hear mommy Daddy, it's okay. I'm safe. To, to somehow have a lost friend uh, who, who died and say, hey, listen, I, I miss you and I love you, but man, keep on living. You've got a good future. You've, you've got good things to accomplish. Somehow you think, isn't that helpful? Isn't that beneficial? Isn't that somehow bringing healing to someone? Listen to me. It's kind of like the psychic. It's either a con job or it's something far darker. And part of the problem is this. You are intentionally bypassing the spirit of God to talk to another spirit. You are saying, God, I know you told me not to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Listen, if you need a word from the spirit, then press into God and his Holy Spirit. Pray, read the Bible, lean on your church family and say, give me a word. I need to hear from you. One of the reasons why we do an annual remembrance service that we're doing tonight, it's not so that we can hear from the spirits of those that we've lost. It's so that the Holy Spirit can comfort us and we can comfort one another as a church family. But this is what it says in the book of Isaiah. It says, when someone calls to you, uh, when someone tells you to consult mediums or spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? In other words, what Isaiah is saying is, why do you need a word from dead Aunt Edna when you can get a word from the living God? But somehow or other, we think that's better, that's more helpful, that's more comforting, that's more peaceful. It's because we've been deceived into believing that what God has for us isn't as good as what's out there. So, can people really uh, summon the dead? Can we, can we really hear from, from those who have died. Again, it can be a con or it can be something far darker. It can be an attempt to reach beyond the veil that separates this life from the afterlife. And God strictly forbids that over and over in the Bible. He says, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And so there's a story in the Bible. It's I found in 1 Samuel. Let me give you a little bit back story here. So Saul is the king of Israel. And at one point, he knew that God had said not to consult mediums and spiritists, not to try and conjure up the dead. And so he expelled all the medium, uh, that mediums from Israel. But now he's later in his reign. And his, and I wouldn't even call him a spiritual advisor. This was really almost like a, a father figure to him, a man named Samuel. Samuel was a prophet of God. He heard from God. 
He heard clearly from God. He's the one who, who, who anointed Saul to be the first king of Israel. And Samuel was, is referred to as the last judge of Israel before the, uh, the, the monarchy started, before the kings ascended to the throne. So Samuel was a man of God, but Samuel died. And because Samuel was no longer alive, Saul was desperate for a word from God. See, he was in a war with the Philistines, and he didn't know what to do. And Samuel used to give him a word, direction, insight from God. And so Samuel's not there, and he needs a word. So this is what it says in uh, Samuel 28. We're just going to read sections of it. Samuel, oh, this is Saul. Saul inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him. Saul then said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium, so I may go inquire of her. Saul swore to her by the Lord. Now make note of that. Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. <laughs> Think about the audacity. God said not to do this, but in God's name, you can do it. That is a mark of the occult. Trying to say that which God said is wrong is actually right. Then the woman asked, whom shall I bring up for you? Please bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice. The king said to her, don't be afraid. Tell me what you see. The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up from the earth. An old man wearing a robe is coming up. Then Samuel knew, then Saul knew it was Samuel. So there's a lot happening there. So first of all, here you have Saul. He asks God for something. He wants something from God. And God doesn't give it to him. Or he doesn't give it to him when he wants or how he wants. And, and almost instantly, Saul rejects his entire value system. I want this. God said, I can't have this. I'm not giving this to you. I'm not giving you the answer you want. And you're not getting your way. And he throws a hissy fit. If you won't give me the answer that I want, if you won't give me any answer, then I'm not happy. And what am I going to do? Whatever God told me not to, I don't care because I want what I want, how I want it, when I want it. So what does he do? He does the thing that God says not to do. God says, don't consult mediums. He says, I'm going to consult a medium because I want what I want. So often in life, that's what we do. God says, this is out of bounds. This isn't right for you. This isn't best for you. I want what I want, and I don't care if I have to reject my entire value system in order to get what I want. And so Saul says, I'm going to consult a medium. Medium says, hey, ah, uh, if I do this, what's going to happen? He says, I know God said not to, but I'm telling you God's okay with it. It's fine. No worries. Let's just do this. It's fine in the name of the Lord. Do what the Lord forbid. Do you want to talk about how warped we can get? That's what the occult does. It leads us to believe that that which is evil is good and that which God called good is evil. It twists everything backwards. And he says, it's fine. God's fine with it. Just do this. So she calls up Samuel and Samuel appears. Now, some people say, was it really Samuel? Was it a deceiving spirit? Was it a familiar spirit? Was it someone impersonating Samuel? You can go on the internet. You can read commentaries. You can find a lot of opinions on a lot of things. Here's my belief for whatever it's worth. Whenever there's a deceiving spirit in the Bible, the Bible says there is a deceiving spirit. It never says that here. As a matter of fact, what it says is, and I think the key is this line right here. Saul knew it was Samuel. It doesn't say Saul was tricked into believing it was Samuel. He said he knew it was Samuel. But whether it was or wasn't isn't even the issue. The issue was that the woman screams out in fear and terror because she knew I crossed a line. And as a result of crossing a line, judgment's coming, not only for me, but Saul's judgment's coming for you. And then Samuel, if you go on and read the story, says, listen, Saul, I already told you, God spoke through me that the kingdom was going to be torn away from you and given to someone better. It's going to be given to David. But as a result of this, because you crossed this line, because you did this thing that God said not to do, it's going to cost you your life, and tomorrow you're dead. And the next day, he dies. See, it's not innocent. It's not just, it's not hurting anybody. It's helpful. I mean, I need a word. I need to know what to do. And, and if God won't give me what I want, then I'm going to do what I want. No, if God won't do 
what you want than do what God wants. But I don't know what he wants. He wants you to be faithful. But I don't know what I'm supposed to do in this situation. He wants you to trust him. But I don't know if I should. He wants you to remain steadfast. There's a lot of things that we know God wants us to do. We just don't always want to do what God wants us to do. We want God to do what we want him to do. But that makes us God and him not. So here, here's, uh, here's the, 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 the crux of it. We can't go around saying, I need a word from a spirit that's not God's spirit. If you need a word, if you need power, if you need insight, ask God for it. So the third characteristic or sign of the occult is this, endeavoring to use spiritual power to manipulate or control people. Endeavoring to use spiritual power to manipulate or control people. Now, do you notice I didn't say outside of God, outside of the Holy Spirit in in this statement? Because, and this isn't the point of this message, but I just feel like I need to touch on this. Because we can, even in the church, use spiritual uh, power to control and manipulate people. And when we do that, even under the name of Christianity, it's a cult in nature. We're not called to control and manipulate people. We're called to speak truth and let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. So, in the context of uh, of the occult, of the paranormal, right? Trying to control people. That would be things like um, spells and incantations and chants and, and guided meditation and, and magic potions and, and white magic or black magic. Anything in order to control and manipulate an outcome to get what you want. And the Bible is replete. Don't do those things. In the old days, it was called witchcraft. Now, in, in our modern times, we, although it's making a resurgence, we don't always hear the word witchcraft. What we hear is the word, I'm a Wiccan or Wicca. Now, Wiccan, Wicca is one of the fastest growing religions in America, but it's just another name for witches, for witchcraft. Now, what they say is we don't use our magic for harm. We use it for help. They don't deny that their chants and their spells and their incantations can be used for harm. They just say we don't use them that way. But it's, 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 it's witchcraft. It's attempting to control things. Wiccas uh, do not believe in God of the Bible. They believe in, they poly, tend to be polytheistic. They believe in a lot of gods. And the main God is the, the, the great goddess, uh, the great mother goddess. And, and the great mother goddess, and then there's other gods under her. And as a result, they, they worship nature. They worship the, the, the moon cycles. They think their power comes from the different cycles of the moon. They worship the stars. They think everything, every, everything out there has a spirit, and they're all connected, rocks, trees, flowers, grass, people, animals, everything has a spear and they're all interconnected. And what, when you mess up, because there's no such thing as sin, when you mess up, what you have to do is learn to elevate your inner God and become a better God so that you can arrive at divinity. But because their main God is the great goddess mother, they, they tend to have a hatred, an animosity, a, 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 a disdain for all things masculine in nature. Even those Wiccans who are men tend to hate masculinity. And if you don't think that there's a war, if you don't think there's a spirit that is attacking masculinity today, open your eyes. We are castrating young boys in the name of progress. We, I'm going to do a series on this, so buckle up next year. How do you fight the Ahab and Jezebel spirit? We're going to talk about the spirit of Elijah. Because I believe that that is what's happening in our culture today. But what we have to realize is this isn't just some innocent thing. There are, uh, there are those who are endeavoring to control and manipulate the world and those around them. What does the Bible say about this? It says in Deuteronomy, it says, Let no one be found among you who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead, Anyone who does these things is, what's the word? See, you're like first service. Nobody wanted to say it. What's the word? Detestable. God hates that. It is, it is vomit in God's mouth. It's detestable. He hates it because it is about power and control. And indeed, if you look, when the gospel, when the church started, 
some 2,000 years ago, and the message of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit's poured out, and the, and the message of grace is being uh, exp exponentially uh, sent out in that region from town to town, city to city, nation to nation. You read in the book of Acts, time and time and time and time and time again, one of the first things that happened was they confronted the occult. You read it in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 19. They confronted the occult and they said, what you see here is power, but it's darkness. And we're going to shine God's power in the light of truth. They didn't shy away from it. They didn't back away from it. Unless you think, well, it was just an Old Testament thing. In Galatians 5, witchcraft is listed as one of the deeds of darkness, the deeds of the flesh. And it says, anyone who practices it will not inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus in the New Testament took it as serious as the Old, uh, the Old Testament. Not something to be messed around with. Because the issue of control and manipulation is power. It's about saying, I want to be in control. I want to be in charge. I want to decide. I want to throw off the vestiges of God's control in my life and be God for myself. That is the heart of witchcraft. right? Think, think about in the beginning of human history, when the devil tempts Eve and Adam, what does he say? <laughs> Listen, God is withholding something from you. That, that fruit isn't bad. That fruit will give you something. You will gain knowledge. You'll gain insight. God said it's bad, but it's really good. God says it's evil, but it's really <clears throat> beneficial because when you eat it, you will be God yourself. You will be the one who decides what's good and evil, what's right and wrong, what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. And that is how the, uh, the occult, the demonic operates. It says you need to be in charge. And that's why it says this in 1 Samuel. It says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Power, control, manipulation. It is open rebellion against God. It's saying, God, I want to do what I want to do, how I want to do it. And only after Adam and Eve ate of the tree did they realize that the death and the, the destruction and the havoc that was going to be wreaked on their life and that we still see today because they were enticed and lured away by a demonic spirit. You don't ever see it on the front end, but oh, you'll see it on the back end. And when you hear the testimonies next week, you're going to say, that is horrible. It will lead you down a path you never wanted to go. Because here's what the occult intends to do. That when you seek power and control outside of God, you are the one who ends up being controlled by a power outside yourself. See, you think you're in control. You think you have this power. You think you're in charge. But ultimately, as Adam and Eve found out, this isn't going to benefit me. It's going to torment me. It's going to destroy me. It's going to cost me. So what is this? Why does Satan tempt us with these things? Why does he lure, uh, lure us with these, with these enticements of, of power and insight and knowledge and a connection with the spirit outside of God? Because Satan always, 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 always uses the paranormal to lead you away from God. He always does. And it starts innocent. It starts, oh, it's fine. It doesn't hurt anybody. And indeed, on the front side, it is innocent and it may be good. But what you need to understand is this, demonic oppression and demonic um, uh, possession are real. Demonic deceit and demonic uh, influence are real. Demonic destruction will come into your life and you think it just started innocently enough. But what happens is you begin to look to a spirit other than the Holy Spirit. You're more enamored by the spirits of this world than the God who created the world. You want to hear a voice other than the voice of God. You want a word from someone other than Jesus Christ, the living word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We become so desperate for that and we get it. And it feels good and it's helpful. But here's what happens. You get a word and you open your heart. And you open your spirit and oppression comes in. Demonic influence comes in. Torment comes in. Some of you can't sleep at night because you have nightmares. And some of it's because you've opened your life to some things. Some of you can't um, have a proper view of sex and sexuality because you've opened yourself up to the spirit of pornography, to a power that's out there. Some of you can't, can't rest your thoughts because you've filled it with so much craziness. 
that you think that there's voices out there talking to you and then you don't know what to do with them and there are voices out there talking to them. But greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And you need to learn by God's grace to shut out all those voices, all those influences to walk in truth. But what happens is we open ourselves up to them. And then torment comes, deceit comes, oppression comes. And because we're not, we've not learned to press into God, what do we do? We go back to that thing that initially made us feel good. And we think if I do more of that, I'll be better. I'll be healed. I'll find peace. And so we go there and it brings momentary peace. And then the torment comes, but it's not at the level of one. Now it's at the level of two. And what do we want? We want more. And then it gets to three and four. And before we know it, our life is in shambles and it's ruined and it's destroyed because the the demonic influence wants to destroy your life and your future to separate you from God and the plans and the purposes that he has. So what does all this mean? Does it mean we need to be afraid? No. (laughs) Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We have the spirit of God inside of us. He's not given us a spirit of fear. We don't need to be timid. We don't need to be afraid. We're called to expose the, the works and the deeds of darkness. So when we see the paranormal, when we see the supernatural, what do we do? We expose it. We call it out. We identify it for what it is and we walk away from it. But what we don't want to do is entertain it. If you've been involved in that, don't stay there. Don't think it's innocent. Don't dabble with it. Don't play with it. Walk away. If you say, I don't know how to do that. Well, in just a moment, we're going to have prayer teams up here. And the first step is this, is that you agree with other people in prayer. The Bible says when we confess our sins, our weaknesses, our struggles with one another, we will be healed. And you say, hey, I've struggled with this. I've opened myself up to this. I don't know how to close that door. When two or three come in an agreement as anything happening on earth, it's done. So you say, God, help me to close that door, to shut it out, and to begin to walk in a way that brings glory and honor to you. But don't be afraid. Oh, don't be afraid. Walk in power. Next week, we're going to learn how to stand when the spiritual attacks come. But for now, I'm going to ask you if you'd stand to your feet, and we're going to pray. As the prayer teams make their way forward, if you'd like prayer this morning, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Let God move right now and do something powerful in your life. Heavenly Father, we come to you. And God, as we prepare to worship you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the power above every power, your throne above every throne, there is nothing above you. You are God of all. We come to you and we proclaim the name of Jesus the peace that passes understanding. God, would your power reign in our lives? And if we've opened a door to anything, God, would you shut that door? We bind the strong man. And God, we stand. We ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit. I just want to invite you, if you'd like prayer, come this morning as we worship God together.